And our second session is on adapting and scaffolding online materials for different proficiency levels. So I'm sure as an online teacher or even a face-to-face -face teacher, you've been in situations where you may have some native speakers who are doing really, really well with the class. And you might have some students who are really just introductory students who are struggling even with the basics. And so to help us out in finding the best materials for situations like this, we have Dr. Leslie Baldwin of Winston-Salem Forts County Schools. And Dr. Baldwin is the World Languages Program Manager for the Winston-Salem Forts County Schools in North Carolina. She's also the Executive Director for the Southern Conference on Language Teaching, also known as SCOLT. Dr. Baldwin has also served as the president of the Foreign Language Association of North Carolina, as well as the National Association of Direct Supervisors of Foreign Languages. She's a professional development consultant for the American Council on Teaching a Foreign Language, also known as ACTL, and she also wants to encourage everyone to come out to the SCULT Conference in March 2020 in Mobile, Alabama. So Dr. Baldwin, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me this afternoon. So Sarah already introduced me, um, so we'll just jump right in. Um, so today we're talking about adapting uh, online materials for different proficiency levels. But in order to do that, we need to talk about proficiency levels first and make sure we're all on the same page with what that means as we talk about those. So if some of you uh, in the audience are OPI raters and you're more than familiar with this, I'm just going to ask you to be patient. Uh, but we do need to make sure that everybody understands what we mean when we talk about these levels. So we'll, we'll discuss these quickly before getting into the conversation about adapting materials for the levels. Um, so, uh, ACTVIL, the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Language, uh, has uh, these uh, proficiency levels that we base our, our instruction, our planning, and our assessment on it, when it comes to language instruction, and they are aligned to the European levels uh, as well. You'll notice that we have an inverted pyramid uh, with the the novice being at the bottom, going all the way up to distinguished, um, with the smaller pieces at the bottom, and it grows as as you move through the levels. Oops, sorry about that. At the novice level, that's where we're talking about our, our language learners are at the word level, uh, maybe the phrase level. They can communicate minimally. Uh, there's a lot of memorization, a lot of repetition. They can create lots of lists. And the speech is very formulaic, where they might memorize a chunk and then they can fill in the blank, like, um, I like to eat or I like to read, I like to swim, but it's all very memorized, very formulaic and repetitive. At the intermediate level, that's when our language learners are at the sentence level and starting to move into the paragraph, paragraph level. And so now they can create much more with language. They have more language under their belt to be able to manipulate and try things with, but uh, it's still not going to be super fluid and there will still be situations where uh, it, it just gets to their limit and they're not able to handle surprise situations and that sort of thing. Um, at the novice level, everything really needs to be a familiar context, something they've done in class and are familiar with. At the intermediate level, they can handle some surprises, but not a whole lot of surprise. And at the advanced level, that's when uh, uh, a learner is very comfortable in the paragraph level. They can narrate and describe in multiple time frames um, and can handle complicated situations and unexpected situations with ease and not be thrown by that. So that inverted pyramid grows not only um, in in size, but also in depth uh, as learners move through the proficiency levels. Because not only do learners gain more language just in the amount of vocabulary and structures that they, they can deal with, it's also growing in complexity and the kinds of language they can use. 
And then there are the superior and distinguished levels, but in the K-12 setting, we really talk more about novice and intermediate. Sometimes we talk about advanced. If we have AP and IB students, um, they might get into that advanced level. And um, in, in, in upper level uh, higher ed courses, you might get into the advanced level. But at K-12, we're mostly dealing with novice and intermediate, depending upon the program models. Uh, so we'll focus our, our, um, our talk there today. If you are a visual learner like me, you can think about the levels this way. A novice learner is a parrot. They do lots of repeating, lots of memorizing and repeating. An intermediate language learner is a survivor. They can get along. They can um, manage in situations where unexpected issues might come up. They're not going to do it in a completely fluid way, but they can get along. And then the advanced language learner is more of a storyteller or a reporter. Their, their speech and their writing is very fluid. They're comfortable across a wide range of topics. Um, they can uh, narrate and describe in multiple time frames uh, and are comfortable in many situations. We're going to look at a couple of examples um, before we, we move into more of the depth of what we're doing today. Um, and as, as you look at this, I'm going to ask you afterwards uh, to put some things in the chat box about what you notice about what this speaker uh, can and can't do with language and also what you notice about the interviewer and uh, what, she, what role she plays in the conversation as well. Dr. Baldwin, I'm sorry to interrupt. Unfortunately, I'm having trouble hearing the video. Okay, I was just going to ask you about that, if that was working well. So, how can we make that work? If you're uh, looking for just an, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Stephen here jumping in. Um, if, uh, Leslie, if you have uh, speakers on your computer, if you can switch from headset to speakers, then we might pick up the audio uh, playing from the speakers through the microphone in your machine. Unfortunately, no, we're not picking up the audio. Might be able to do a quick improvisation. So maybe Dr. Baldwin, if you'd like me to maybe mimic um, a novice speaker, if you'd like to give me some questions and I can sort of mimic what a novice speaker would do in English and we could move up to different proficiency levels if that might work. We can try that. Um, try that. Um, so Sarah, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where do you live? I live in house with family. I have a son. I have a dog. I have a daughter. My house is small. My house is very nice. And um, tell me about uh, what kind of uh, what kind of foods do you like? What do you like to eat? I eat foods. I eat fruits. I eat strawberries. I don't eat oranges. I like to eat. And so, um, what um, what kinds of fruits and vegetables do you like? 
I like to eat strawberries. I like to eat carrots. All right, so we'll stop there. Thank you, Sarah, for the impromptu. Um, so Sarah is is really giving an example of some novice high speech because she's at the sentence level and is sort of doing that formulaic chunk where she's filling in the blank with that, that chunk that she knows about I like. Um, so what do you notice? Uh, you can put some answers in the chat box. What do you notice about what uh, Sarah could do with language and how she could answer the questions? So we have some feedback coming in at the novice level. It's pretty broken despite using some sentences. We're discussing things like daily life and keeping uh, connectors, connectors to a minimum. A lot of memorization, a lot of repeating, use of simple words, a lot of repetition and very formulaic. Very formulaic, lots of repetition. Uh, and there's a, a resource link at the end of this where I'll show you where you can go watch these videos uh, if you have not seen them before because they're really nice examples of the proficiency levels. And sweet Leonore right here is more of a of a novice mid speaker maybe and she does lots of listing and she just lists lots of things without putting them in sentences. And she also uses a lot of Spanish in her response because she just doesn't have enough English to, to keep, to stay in English the whole time. And so she'll list several things and then she'll say something in Spanish and try to figure it out in English. Um, and a lot of what she uses are cognates because those are that's what's familiar to her at the novice mid level. Um, so, uh, Sarah, let's try that um, with a little bit of intermediate and see if we can uh, see the differences there. So tell me a little about yourself. My name is Sarah. I live in the United States. I live with my family in a house. I moved to the United States in 2016, and I live in the United States now. And I like to read books and play games with my son. What kinds of books do you like to read? I like to read books that are mystery books. I like to read books that are true stories. I like reading about people who died, um, people, people's stories who died. That sounds uh, very interesting. You can learn a lot that way. Um, so let's compare uh, Sarah's speech as a novice speaker with her speech as an inner, as a, I'm sorry, as an intermediate speaker with her speech as a novice speaker. And what kind of differences did you notice? You can put that in the chat box. Use of relative clauses. That was one of the things that I was going for to make sure I included that. <laughs> um, ability to respond to questions, but only using the present tense. Um, more vocabulary, um, and again, only in familiar situations. Um, also response times. I was able to respond a little bit faster as an intermediate speaker, whereas a novice speaker is going to need that time to sit and process and come up with the right words. Sure. And one of the things that, that you'll see if you go back and watch these videos is that in the novice example, the interviewer has to do a lot of repetition of the questions and reword the questions and give either or options. Like um, when she asks about whether she likes fruit, she gives examples and says, you know, do you like apples or oranges? Or uh, if you like vegetables, do you, you know, what kinds of vegetables do you like? Do you like broccoli, zucchini? And has to give lots of examples to prompt the answers. Whereas in the intermediate example, the interviewer doesn't have to give those examples. She can ask 
open-ended questions and the, the, the respondent is able to answer appropriately and doesn't need that, that restating of the question. Um, although she's a little limited in what she can say. So while Sarah gave me a fair amount of information, she's not able to give me extreme details about what we're discussing and it sort of stays at the surface level. Um, so think for a minute, you don't have to put anything in the chat box, but just think for a minute about your students and how those descriptions compare with your students' language performance and what they're like in, in your classes. Are they more novice? Are they more intermediate? What sounds like your students? And, and, and then also realize that if, especially if you're teaching um, level one, maybe level two, they're at the novice level. Sometimes it feels like you're pulling teeth to try to get language out of them. Well, that's, that's really kind of appropriate because that's what proficiency level they're, they're at. And, and there does have to be a lot of eliciting on your part in order to get them to produce language. So sometimes while you feel like you're repeating yourself over and over and finding different ways to say it or different ways to show the language, that's what they need. They need that repetition at the novice level. Uh, many states have standards that, that are aligned to these actual proficiency levels and include exit outcomes or exit outcome expectations for the courses. For example, in North Carolina, uh, our standards say that students should be at novice mid by the time they finish a level one high school course and at novice high by the time they finish a level two high school course. Other states developed proficiency standards after North Carolina and they set the bar a little bit higher with level one at uh, ending at novice high and level two ending at intermediate low. If you're not sure about proficiency expectations that have been set for the courses you teach, then you might want to um, check on that, find out about that because the targets should affect your planning and your assessment. So we've talked uh, just briefly about those proficiency levels and I'm sure many of you were, were familiar with them already. But again, just wanted to make sure everybody was using the same vocabulary and had the same understanding. We also need to talk a little bit about how this affects your planning and your assessment. Because when you thought about your students and where they, they fall on that proficiency continuum, you might have thought that something sounded a little confusing because uh, when we went through the pyramid, I said that, that level one students are at the word level, but you're thinking that you have your level one students write sentences and you have your, your level two students write paragraphs. Uh, but the proficiency levels say that that is not what those uh, that at the novice level what they should be doing. So this is a little confusing. Well, the difference there is between performance and proficiency. So we need to talk about that briefly because that sometimes becomes confusing when we talk about um, uh, assessment and planning in the classroom and then how we adapt those materials and what our targets are. So performance is what happens in the classroom. It's based on classroom instruction. It's very dependent upon the curriculum of what's in your course, whether that's a physical classroom or an online classroom. Um, whereas a proficiency is independent of that course and that classroom and that curriculum. It doesn't matter uh, what kind of program or how language was acquired. Uh, and it's, it's not dependent upon what's been happening in the classroom. Performance is, a, is language that's developed within that course, within that instructional setting, whereas proficiency is about spontaneous language. It's not rehearsed, it's real world. Proficiency is what, is what happens when you take me to Madrid and drop me in the street and expect me to be able to communicate, whereas performance is what am I doing in that online course or in that physical classroom before I go on a trip. Performance is all about familiar context and familiar content because it's what you've been doing in the course. It's, a, it's, it's your familiar curriculum. So it's, it's going to be a context that, that the students understand and have had some instruction in. 
Whereas proficiency could be anything. There's a broad context, there's a broad content because it's all about authentic situations. When I go on that trip to Madrid, I don't know what situations I'm necessarily going to encounter or what conversations I might need to have. And it may or may not be familiar based on what uh, happened in, in a classroom prior to that. In performance, we're talking about learners acquiring functions, the structures, the vocabulary, through the tasks that they do within your course. And they're prepare, they're doing those to prepare for a final performance assessment that is going to tie back to all of that instruction. So in your course, you are leading students to your assessment through those tasks and you're assessing their performance on those tasks. Whereas proficiency is about sustained performance. It's how can I communicate in repeated ways in different contexts over time. So it might be that by the end of a particular unit in the course, I look like an intermediate low speaker or writer because I'm really comfortable with that content. I'm very comfortable with those structures that you've taught and the vocabulary that you've taught. But then as soon as you start a new unit, I drop right back and I can't write a sentence anymore because I don't have enough language to do so in that new context. That means I can't sustain that performance over time. But once I can sustain that performance over time in multiple contexts, then we're getting at proficiency. So in the classroom, we're really talking about performance. You're assessing performance, but you're targeting a particular proficiency level so that you know what are the kinds of tasks they should be able to do at this level and what are the kinds of tasks you're pushing them to be able to do. So if you have level one students who are at the novice level, then they're very good at lists and they can make lots of lists of words and they can categorize them in charts and in Venn diagrams and all sorts of things like that. But if we want them to move to the novice mid and start to push into the intermediate level, then they have to take those lists and they have to start putting them in sentences and putting them together with sentences. And that's why we start to give them those sentence starters and those chunks that help them do those formulaic sentences because that's the beginning of them being able to use language at the sentence level. And once they have lots of those chunks and lots of vocabulary and all those pieces, then they start to move into the intermediate level as they start to recombine those memorized chunks that they know. And so uh, your tasks, your planning and your assessment should be targeted to those skills so that you're trying to push them along that proficiency continuum. If you to better understand those proficiency levels, um, I have a link at the end to the proficiency guidelines where it also has examples in multiple languages of speaking and writing. So you can really see more what they look like and what you can expect from your students uh, because that should help you design your tasks that are related to the online resources that you find. We're gonna talk about that in just a minute. So if we're talking about adapting resources for various proficiency levels, uh, and I know that subsequent, re re uh, I'm sorry, subsequent webinars are about finding those resources, then we must be talking about authentic resources. And so in the first hour, you were talking about um, OERs and, and th those different uh, pieces, we're going to talk about sort of a broader definition of resources um, as we talk about adapting them um, than in your, your first hour, because really online resources um, for a language course can be just about anything. And if they are authentic resources, then that means that's anything you're finding out there that is made for native speakers by native speakers. And it wasn't created for the comfortable confines of your language course. Again, whether that's online or in a physical classroom, it's because it was created for native speakers, not for language learners. And so when we talk about those authentic resources, we might be talking about text, we might be talking about video, we might be talking about audio. So students are either reading, viewing, or listening. Of course, video would be listening, but would have some um, 
so, some visual help to go along with that listening. Uh, but And the reason we do this and we don't just stick with what's provided in a textbook, whether it's an online textbook or um, a physical one, we really want to get at these online authentic resources so that our students know what real language looks like. We have here um, one of my favorite images of the rubber duck and the real duck. So if we consider that the rubber duck is a traditional textbook for a language class and the real duck is an authentic resource, it's either a song or a poem or it's a video you find on YouTube or an infographic or a newspaper article, whatever it might be, it's an, it's an authentic resource that was not designed specifically for the classroom. Well, what happens if our language learners only ever interact with rubber ducks? That is the only experience they have with a duck. They only know rubber ducks. They've never seen a real duck in their lives and they only have interactions with rubber ducks. Well, what's gonna happen when they, inter they at some point come across an authentic resource, a real duck? Are they gonna know how to interact with that real duck? What's gonna happen when they do? Um, are they even going to recognize the real duck because he looks pretty different from the rubber duck? Are they even going to realize this is something in a language that they are familiar with and have some skills in and be able to access it? Or are they just going to say, I, I can't do that because that's too overwhelming. It doesn't look like my rubber duck and I don't know what to do with that. And so we want to make sure that while sometimes the rubber duck and the textbook resources can be helpful, those authentic resources that we might find online and in all sorts of places, give students experience with the real duck, with real language. Um, and, and then it's our job as instructors to help them figure out how to interact with that real duck, um, even if it looks a little scary and intimidating. So that's where we really get to talking about adapting and scaffolding resources, no matter where we find them or what they might be. They might be videos, blogs, websites, infographics, news outlets, advertisements. It could be just about anything that you find that could be useful in your course that's in the target language. But often teachers search and search and they look at videos and they look at infographics and they look at articles and they say, you know, this is great. This is about this topic that we're on in my course but it's an authentic resource. It's a real duck. And it has way too many unfamiliar words. It has slang, it has colloquialisms. Um, and I just don't think I'm gonna be able to use it because there, it's too high. It's, it's written at too high a level. I have novice level students, and this is written for someone at the advanced and superior or even distinguished level because it's for native speakers. And so what do you do with that? Well, here's the mantra for today, is that it's about the task and not the text. It's about the resource itself and, and what you ask students to do with it. You want to align your task to the performance guidelines for that proficiency level. So, that, so when we talk about adapting for different proficiency levels, that's why it's important to understand what those proficiency levels are and what the skills are that go along with each level so that your task is appropriate to that proficiency level. If you're teaching level one, they're novice learners, and that means they can't be expected to understand all of the details in a text or a video or an audio selection. Novice learners don't do that. That's not part of their description. They can be expected to get the gist if there's enough visual content, enough cognates, uh, and, and enough, uh, enough of a familiar context for them to at least get the general idea. So novice learners might be able to underline words they think they know. They might circle cognates, um, or maybe the text is used to help students look for a particular grammar structure in that context rather than in isolation. But regardless of whether it's a video or a song or a newspaper article or a website, it's always about the task 
and not the text. And the text, I mean, I'm sorry, the task is what should be aligned to that proficiency target, not the text. So you could find one text and use it with multiple prof proficiency levels. You just adapt what you're asking them to do. So often we find something and we think automatically, oh, we're going to watch this video and then I'm going to give them comprehension questions that ask about the main idea and details of what was in the video. But that's not always the case and that's not necessarily appropriate depending upon the proficiency level of your students. So again, if you're teaching those novice levels, those lower level classes, that's not what they should be able to, able to do with an authentic text. So we want to think about different things that that students might be able to do with text other than the traditional, here's some comprehension questions about what's in here. Maybe there are examples of structures you want to point out. Maybe there are um, numbers in there that help them with quantities. Uh, maybe there's particular cognates or you want them to start to understand what cognates are through a particular um, text or maybe it's just um, some real obvious pieces they can point out and not the minute details. So let's look at a few examples. We have here a, an infographic about uh, fast food versus healthy food. Um, if you're not a Spanish speaker, um, which just kind of, it's, it's not real complicated. It has a little bit of vocab, some calorie counts on there. So let's think just a little bit um, first about the novice level, um, or really either one, the novice and the intermediate, because you, you might have multiple levels. Uh, and we, we have enough time, so put some ideas in the chat box. What could you have a novice student do with this infographic, and how might you adapt that for an intermediate student? If they're at the novice proficiency level or the intermediate proficiency level, what are some different things that you might have them do with this infographic? We have some folks chiming in in the chat. Uh, for novice speakers, they could talk about likes and dislikes and make some lists, listing the items in the picture. Uh, for novices, the vocabulary is also really useful. They can read the words out loud, which would be great. Um, they could talk about foods that they like, foods they don't like. Putting foods in order, so maybe listing them from the highest calorie count to the lowest calorie count. For intermediate students, they could give some advice. So maybe using um, some set phrases to give advice based on the calorie counts, what they should eat. Intermediate speakers might be able to talk about what is healthy. They could write the numbers out in the target language. That might be helpful too. Uh, intermediate students could share uh, some recipes, like that idea related to each category of food. And I'm seeing some really good ideas. Um, check marks and check marks for yes and a cross out for no for maybe the novice speakers. Uh, so novice again, listing items, intermediate, maybe writing some sentences, maybe give some advice and identifying food categories might also be intermediate exercises. Could be, could be. So those are some great, great examples. I put a few things here uh, as well. So at the novice level, um, I think like some of you said, you use the infographic for the students to be able to talk about examples of low calorie foods and high calorie foods, um, to whether, whether they're talking or so a lot of these could be speaking or writing, just, just depending upon how you design it. Um, maybe they're identifying the number of calories in various foods. So they can say what the food is and how many calories are in it based on this infographic. Again, that gets them practicing um, using numbers without just rote memorization and it's in a context, there's a reason for it. Um, maybe you use this infographic to create an information gap activity. Um, so you take the infographic, you make two versions of it, where certain things are deleted on one version and the other things are deleted on the other version. And then in pairs, they have to ask and answer questions to figure out how to fill in their their blanks. Um, those can be a great way to do an interpersonal, a, a structured interpersonal activity at the novice level when they're not really ready to op 
to just kind of open-ended ask and answer questions. This gives them a very directed way to ask and answer questions and, and get answers based on a visual input. Because um, again, those novice learners really need a lot of uh, visual support for the language. So an infographic can be a great way to provide that. Um, at the intermediate level, uh, I put in here um, using it as a basis for an interpersonal task about um, healthy and unhealthy foods. Maybe they're asking and answering questions of peers about what they eat or don't eat and why. A novice level student might be able to say what they eat, but they're not going to really be able to back it up with why. And at the intermediate level, they should be able to start uh, give reasons for that and answer that why question. That's one thing that distinguishes the two. Uh, maybe they write a blog post or an article for a local Spanish newspaper about why fast food is unhealthy based on the data in the infographics. So they have to use what it provides in order to write their reasoning. Um, within the article. So again, we have one text, we have one resource, but we can do multiple things with it um, depending upon the proficiency level that we want to target. So our tasks should be targeting the skills of that proficiency level um, that, that we're working with. And again, we're kind of focusing here on the novice and intermediate levels because that's just simply more common in most of our courses, whether you're online or um, in a physical setting, that's just more, more common. Let's look at another example. We'll do the same thing. So we have, this is from, um, I took this from El País, from uh, uh, the, the main newspaper in Spain. Um, so what might novice learners do? What might intermediate learners do? What's, what are some tasks that you might design if you used um, this text? We have some answers coming in. Um, one suggestion is to look for structures. Novices can look for cognates. Um, for novices, they might also be able to circle different parts of speech, find some familiar words, maybe take a guess as to what the article's about. And let's see. Um, some novices might be able to ask some questions. So for example, asking when, where, and what. Um, look at the colors in the image. Sure, some, some very uh, novice low students might be able to do some colors. For intermediate, they might be able to ask and answer some questions about the text. Um, students might also be able to read, recognize some basic vocabulary and some basic verbs in the article. Uh, the intermediate might also be able to summarize the text in their own words and maybe discuss the topic as well. Also, intermediate might be able to give their opinions and say if they agree or disagree with the content of the article. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, so this article is about um, kind of the, the controversy that's come out around the new Joker movie and whether it whether it glamorizes violence and um, uh, and that that sort of theme, so yeah, I think some of you said um, predict what the article is about, highlight familiar words or cognates. It might be that with novice learners, all you do is use the title and the little subtitle there and the picture, and you don't even use the article at all, just just to get at some some predictions and some some language. Um, I like what somebody said about just describing the picture. Can they identify some colors? At, at novice low, they could do that. Um, maybe novice mid, novice high, they could describe Joker and what he looks like, um, whether they think he's pretty or ugly or scary. <laughs> um, I'm sure they could come up with some good some good descriptions for that. Um, and maybe if, if they're listing cognates or familiar words, then maybe you have them compare that list with a peer and they try to get more words from the peer than what they originally came up with. Um, that could be one way to turn it into a, a little bit of a, a more interactive um, activity and help them continue to build their, their vocabulary and their language from their peers. At the intermediate level, um, 
uh, I just pasted in here an introductory paragraph. The article is, is much longer than this, but maybe you just use the introductory paragraph. There's nothing that says you have to use the whole thing that's there. Again, you are scaffolding and adapting the text, so you can do with it what you want to. You don't have to use the whole article. You can just use part of it if you think the whole article is a little much. Um, Maybe they identify familiar phrases and words, um, and then you use that to, to build to more meaning. Um, one uh, idea that uh, can work with, with um, it's often used with struggling readers um, in, the, in the English language arts setting, but it certainly applies to the language learning setting as well, I think, um, especially at the intermediate level, is if you give students a text, and have them black out words that they know they do not know. They, they absolutely do not know. And this word is going to be a stumbling block as they try to, to read this because they're going to get to that word and go, I have no idea what this is. I'm stuck and I can't move on until I figure out what this word is. Well, good readers know that that's not necessarily the case. We skip over what we don't know and then we try to figure it out from the context. But if you have students black out the unknown words, um, that they know they don't know and then read it without those <clears throat> like just try to read it skipping over those blacked out sections and then see what kind of understanding they get from it that can really help readers who um, who struggle when they don't know every single word and you all know you have students like that who want to know what the translation is for every single word there before they feel like they can understand any of it and in working with authentic resources, that's simply not going to work. They have to learn to kind of work around what they don't know, what they're not familiar with, and, and try to figure some things out. So if they black out what they don't know and then read it, often that can help them um, get over those roadblocks and still get meaning out of the text. Um, and I think someone said maybe they can provide, uh, prepare an opinion statement on whether they agree with the, the context of the article. Is violence glamorized in movies or not? Um, and then let them have paired conversations about that um, and discuss their, their opinions. And then maybe that could even become a class debate. Um, so again, task not text, and don't always think you have to use the whole text. Maybe you just use pieces of it for your, for your purposes. Let's look at one more example. In this one, we don't even have text. We're not, we're not talking about um, video or audio. This is just an image, um, and this comes from Hungry Planet. If you haven't used those images, they can be really, really great for a language classroom. Um, so quickly, let's do the same thing. How much do you use this image with novice and with intermediate? So novice students would be able to make lists of what they see, maybe put those lists into some different categories. They can describe where things are, maybe list some of the drinks, list some of the foods. Uh, talk about some characteristics of the people in the picture. For intermediate, they might be able to conjugate some verbs to describe what the family's doing. Intermediate students might also be able to answer questions like, where are they? What are they celebrating? Is this something you celebrate in your country? And maybe compare some events. And intermediate students might also be able to create a story around the picture. Mm -hmm. And novice, uh, maybe they can, again, making some lists and kind of doing more basic things. Sure. Um, so these images from Hungry Planet are uh, families from across the world in different cultures, and it shows their groceries and what they eat for a week in that family. And this particular one is from France. Um, uh, and so those are, they're great images to use for different cultural contexts because they're from different countries all around the world. So you might pick images that aren't necessarily related to your target language. Maybe you pick one of the images from, there are some from China and some from different countries in Africa um, and the Middle East. Those, those could, could bring in some interesting concepts as well. But certainly, um, novices can identify the, the various things they see, the foods, the family members. Maybe they can describe the family in some limited ways or the room. 
Um, they might be able to talk about the foods with some simple sentences. Uh, maybe they could do some categorizing of healthy, unhealthy, um, or compare this, uh, this French family's diet with their own diet uh, in a Venn diagram or in a chart. Again, novices are really great at those, those kinds of comparisons that are at the word phrase level. Uh, for intermediate, um, uh, like someone said, they can describe the scene or different aspects of it, um, but at more of the sentence level building into paragraphs. Um, they might use the picture to talk with a partner uh, to make comparisons of their preferences and their own diets, which is better and why. Is, is my diet better than what I see here of this French family or is it, is it worse and, and, and why? What are the differences that I see there? Um, they might create their own similar picture with um, the food they eat, let's say in a day, and then write descriptions um, about their own diet, what do they eat in a day, and then use that for multiple follow-up activities. And so one thing about authentic resources, whether it's images, infographics, text, videos, songs, whatever it might be, one major thing to remember is to get the bang for your buck with one resource. Create multiple interpretive, presentational, and in interpersonal tasks that are all based on that one resource regardless of what it is um, for like for this last example if they do the the photo of their food in a day and write descriptions will then take um, take those pictures and the descriptions mix them all up in some way and have the students find matches um, and there there are certainly some uh, some some websites or online apps that would help you help you do that so that students could do that. Um, so then you're not having to develop all the materials. The students have created them for you with what they created. Um, and then you could have them do an interpersonal task where they ask and answer questions about each other's photos and decide who has the best diet um, in the room or in the in the course. Um, so once you've found something you think is worth using, don't just use it for one thing. I think often as teachers, that's what we do. We find this video and we're like, this is a great video. I'm going to use this. And I show it one time and we do some comprehension about it and then that's it. But I spent hours looking for that one video. So get more bang for your buck. Um, milk it for what it's worth. You, they could probably do three different interpretive activities with one resource regardless of what it is. And then that might lead to a presentational activity and that could lead to an interpersonal activity, all aligned with one another, all based on the same resource. Um, not just having them read or listen and then answer questions, but have them read, listen, watch multiple times with a different task each time um, to help them intentionally work on the meaning or the other aspects. Um, because especially, remember, for novice learners, the objective might not be about comprehension of the entire thing, especially specific details. There might be other possibilities um, for novice learners and what they might do with that text. And so if you have them read it multiple times, maybe the first time is just for circling those cognates. The second time is for underlining other familiar words and phrases. And then um, maybe the third time is for that particular structure you want them to point out um, before you move into um, other activities with that resource. So since you've spent time finding it and it takes time to find these authentic resources that you wanna use, use it for as much as you can and let it lead into um, other activities. That's just more engaging for your students and helps you get more bang for your buck. Um, so here are a few uh, resources for further exploration. Those proficiency guidelines are on the ACTFL website. The can-do statements, the ACTFL can-do statements can be very helpful in uh, putting the um, proficiency guidelines and those expectations in student-friendly language um, so that you and they can better understand what it means to be novice, novice mid, novice high. 
the keys to assessing language performance is a text uh, that Actful published um, that has really nice examples of performance tasks aligned to different proficiency levels and nice examples of how you can use resources in different ways. Um, and then Actful also has virtual learning modules that can be very helpful um, uh, as well with different aspects of proficiency levels, um, authentic resources, and how, how to use those. Um, so I think we're right on time for our uh, question and answer session. Thank you, Dr. Baldwin. And yes, if I can just uh, elaborate a bit on your advice about milking it for what it's worth. When you do find these fantastic, authentic resources, you can always repurpose them, find a different task, um, have students do something else related to the video that you might have found or related to that flyer you might have dug up from somewhere. But that's definitely great advice. Thank you for that. So we had some great questions come through. One person asked, what's the use of assessing performance instead of proficiency? So, um, well, you really want to, I mean, both are important, but within a classroom or within a course situation, you're not really going to be assessing proficiency. So in order to assess proficiency, students would have to take um, an Apple OPI, um, an oral proficiency interview, or some, some other official um, approved assessment for that. Um, but within your, your classroom, you're really assessing performance because you're assessing what you've taught. You've, you're assessing that familiar context and what they're used to. And so that is what you are assessing is performance. But if your planning and your assessments are targeting a proficiency level, then, then you're, you're assessing the appropriate performance that's leading to a proficiency level. And then if they took an OPI or an Apple or a STAMP assessment, um, or anything like that, then that would give them an official proficiency rating, but within your classroom or in, within your online course, that's really not what you're assessing um, unless you're using one of those official assessments. Gotcha. That definitely helps to have that clarification. How could you work with a multi-level group? So a uh, prime example, if you have maybe some novice speakers and you have some folks maybe in the intermediate groups, um, in my personal experience, I usually get a few heritage speakers intermingled in there. How could you best work with a multi-level group? Um, so again, I, th I think um, that's where it's about the task and not the text. So you, you pick one text and you say to these five novice level students, this is what I want you to do with this. This is what I want you 10 students to do with this that are at the intermediate level and then I've got maybe four heritage speakers over here I want you to do a separate task um, and and students are really fine with that they understand that they're at different levels and and the novice speakers certainly understand they're at a different level than the heritage speakers they should have different tasks um, that's that's not a bad thing um, so so again it's that task versus text and they have different assignments really good and um, whenever you're presenting a video, how do you deal with students, especially those uh, lower level students who are maybe terrified of those authentic texts? Um, I can certainly relate to sometimes you do have those cases where you mentioned where you have the student who needs to know the meaning of every word in order to be willing to work with that. What advice do you have to help them break outside of their comfort zones? Sure. So, um, so again, I think it goes back to what are you asking them to do? Because if you hand that novice level student this, whatever it is, article, infographic, video, whatever it is, and they just go, oh my gosh, that's so overwhelming. I can't possibly answer these questions about it because I don't understand anything. Well, maybe that's not the right task. And so what can they get out of it so that they become comfortable with it? Because that's part of it, is, if using authentic resources, is helping our novice learners especially become comfortable with that real duck, with the authentic resource. And so again, if, if all you have them do is pick out cognates, then that starts to make it less scary. And they start to see, oh, look, there are some words in here that I know. It just looks scary when I looked at the big whole thing, but now that I'm only looking for these pieces, 
it's not so scary. Or maybe it's just looking for words that have to do with the context you're in. So if you're in a unit on healthy foods or, or you know, eating habits or something like that, maybe they are looking for food vocabulary that they know and that's all they have to look for. So it's not about trying to understand all of this information, but just to find the little pieces that they know. Definitely. And that can be a big help in just helping students to relax and to open up their minds to the possibility they might be able to use some of these texts. Um, for folks who teach levels that are or languages that are more logographic, like Arabic or Japanese in my case, um, sometimes we find it difficult to use some of those authentic resources since students <laughs> can't use the cognates. Do you have any suggestions, sure. especially for the novice level? Um, I mean, I think I would say make it as visual a as possible. So I probably, I probably wouldn't pick a text that is all text and no visual whatsoever. Um, I would probably start with things that are more in the infographic idea or um, charts or things that have very little bits of actual language and more things they can access. So maybe it's a graph or a chart that has a little bit of language, but also has some numbers and things that I can easily access. Um, or maybe the maybe the the graph or the chart is even labeled with pictures and not with characters. Um, so that I have to know what that picture is and I have to be able to say that in Japanese or Chinese or Arabic or whatever it might be, but I'm not having to recognize the character and yet I'm still using this authentic piece. Definitely, and I loved your example of the infographic. Um, resources like that are often very helpful, especially if they're bright and colorful and um, kind of maybe a little more friendly um, rather than something that's, you know, just kind of a, a picture with a lot of advanced characters on it. So that can definitely be a big help for sure. Mm -hmm. um, we did have a question come through asking about proficiency levels being at a continuum and if you might be able to do a little bit more explaining about that. Um, okay, so about the, the, about how the levels move from one to another, how they're on that continuum. I think that might be helpful, yes, if you don't mind, please. Sure. So, um, so that that inverted pyramid that we we looked at um, originally kind of shows that that continuum um, within that pyramid. So, as language learners, no matter who we are or what age we are, we start as novice low with a new language, and at that level, we really know almost nothing. We know some words. And that's about it. We can't even put the words together. Um, we just know isolated words. Uh, but then as we move through those proficiency levels, we move from novice into intermediate, into advanced, um, and so forth and so on, then our language builds and our skills build. And on the actual continuum, within the novice, intermediate, and advanced levels, they break it up into three sub-levels because language changes so much within that level. So even within the novice level, if I'm novice low, all I have are isolated words. But if I'm novice high, I've begun to put those words into some very formulaic sentences. I can't do it all the time and I can't always maintain sentences, but in some contexts, I have some sentences. And so even within that novice level, there's a range, but I'm building my skills as I move through that range and they continue to build as I go into the intermediate and advanced. And one thing to remember is that as you move through those proficiency levels, it increasingly takes more time to move to the next level. So within the novice range, I can very quickly move from novice, mid, novice low to novice mid, because all that means is I've taken my isolated words and now I'm combining them into two words and phrases. Um, and that happens very quickly. But to move from the sentence level into I can now comfortably put things together into paragraphs in consistent ways in multiple contexts, well that takes a lot more time for those language levels to develop. Um, and so while I might move through novice relatively quickly, I'm going to move through it intermediate much slower and then advance much slower. And I'm probably going to need some experiences living abroad or studying abroad or being immersed in some way in order to move through that advanced level 
because of the skills that are required. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, um, but that, that's kind of what that continuum means. I think that was a great overview, especially for those who might not be too familiar with um, how levels are assessed. So that was definitely very helpful. Thank you. Might have time for one more question. Um, a question comes through asking about students who are at different proficiency levels in the same course. Um, there's concern about the final course grade maybe not accurately showing their performance in the course. So for example, the students that are at the lower levels of proficiencies, they might receive some higher grades on some of their tasks than the heritage speakers who maybe are given some more complex tasks. Um, what are your thoughts on that, especially in a public education setting where we do need to be a little bit more mindful of grades? Sure. So, um, so with any performance task, you're going to have a, a rubric that you're using. And so that rubric can be applicable to the heritage speaker, just as it can be applicable to um, an intermediate or uh, a novice speaker. And so um, I, th I think it's, if your rubric is designed appropriately, then your grades are still gonna be equitable um, because it's, it's also not fair to give the heritage speaker and the novice speaker the exact same task and have the novice speaker maybe make an 80 and the heritage speaker make a hundred because they're a heritage speaker. Like that's also inequitable. And so if the task is appropriately aligned to their levels, um, then when you use the rubric, it should do the same thing. And so even if my task was more challenging because I'm a heritage speaker, my grade should still be equitable because the task is at my level. Really good. And the rubrics are definitely very helpful in cases where you're assessing kind of open-ended situations. So thank you for that clarification. So I think that's about all the time we have left. Um, Dr. Baldwin, again, we just want to thank you so much for coming in and talking with us about finding some of these fantastic authentic materials and helping us to leverage them for students at all levels. Again, thank you very much for your time. Um, it was great to be here today. Great having you with us. Um, just a few basic housekeeping things. Um, you'll notice that in the chat that we are pasting in the link to the feedback survey. So please take a moment to go ahead and complete that feedback survey. There'll be one for each of our segments. There was also one earlier um, for Dr. Meinke. So you'll wanna make sure that you go back and take care of that one if you haven't done that yet. And otherwise, we will be back here next week at the same time that you attended. So I know you folks are all over the world, but be sure to come back for the next session. It'll be at the next time, at the same time rather, next week. And we look forward to seeing everybody back here again. Thank you very much for your time, for coming out. It was great having everybody with us. And we will see you next week. Please keep an eye out in the email that you registered for the seminar for for your TED Ed lessons. And be sure to watch the video that I posted in YouTube a few days ago that illustrates how to create your three, two, one reflections if you are interested in earning the digital badge. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great week.